I'd like to start by thanking, obviously, Studio Urban and Architecture Alive and the Planning Authority for supporting my presence here this evening. Um, feel free to heckle me. I do like interventions, or we can save our questions until the end. Um, and it's obviously nice to be hosted in such a prestigious venue, um, which, as you probably know, um, this library was built in 1776 by um, a, actually a Polish-Italian architect um, called Stefano Itar. And it's a really brilliant example of neoclassical architecture in Malta. When you look at the facade, you know, you've got the symmetry and the Doric and ion or, um, Ionic references in the columns and so on. And obviously, I'm now based in New York, which is a city of skyscrapers. Um, and I, I've been reading recently that Malta's not so keen on skyscrapers, but apparently Zaha's skyscraper is still happening. Um, but it's an interesting analogy here when you think about what does architecture's afterlife mean. And I was just listening, obviously, to Antoine's description of my talk. And I do like to mess with the brief a little bit. So I'm going to take you on a, a much more colourful journey than perhaps that description captured. Um, but in the case of the library, what you have is something that's an appropriation of colonial styles from somewhere else in the same way that a skyscraper is. So to some extent, these ideas that have started in other regions and other contexts uh, migrate around and in some ways more effective in the new application and in the original application. Um, so if you hold that idea in your head about what architecture's skill set is and how it can influence things, that will kind of give you a clue about the essence of this talk. So um, obviously I've been hit, I'm here really specifically to talk about architectural education in relation to practice, but in a way architectural practice is education's afterlife because what we teach in schools is really what is then practiced professionally and by implication shapes the built environment. And my obsession, if you like, with architectural education started um, a few years ago now, nearly a decade ago, when I began a PhD, a joint PhD, because obviously one PhD was not enough, on architecture and education. So I looked very extensively at learning theories, trying to understand why architecture was taught in the way it was, and really was it that effective. Um, and as part of that PhD, I kind of turned some of it anyway into this Book, Radical Pedagogies, that was very specifically about British-based architectural educators framing what British-based architecture is, um, because you had Beatrice Colomina's Radical Pedagogies, but that's written from the perspective of an American academic looking at the world's pedagogies through her American lens. And our contestation was that we needed to frame our own education system in order to really understand its value. But what was important about the book, which I'm now going to, in some ways, diminish, <laughs> is that I started out very positive about architecture's role and about its ability to make a meaningful contribution to the world. I thought that despite its declining incomes, the, the spectre of unpaid internships, the long hours culture, the public indifference to what we do, the architecture, despite all of this, still had a value, could still make a meaningful contribution. And I really wanted to understand what architecture education was doing to create that contribution. Um, and what's important to notice about the term radical is that although we identify it as being sometimes a confrontation of the status quo, um, radical in Latin just means root. It means going back to some sense of core identity and core purpose, um, which is obviously difficult in architecture because there isn't really a lot of consensus and maybe that's what makes it interesting. But the principal conceit of the book is that actually architecture is trying to be too many things or do too many things that um, of all of the obligations it seems to carry, startling statistics like one in four architects in the UK and one in three architects in the US will be sued by their clients at some point in their careers reveals the extent of the risks architects are taking by possibly claiming to be an expert in too many things but really a true expert of very little. Um, so our position was that actually architects may well find in an uncertain future ahead of us that we would be more inclined towards specialisation and that wouldn't necessarily mean fragmentation in a bad way, that it could be in many ways constructive. So if you think about medicine, how that is, um, if you like, fragmented into all kinds of specialisations, no one really sees that as being problematic. It hasn't diminished the value of those careers nor indeed their reputation in terms of their contribution. But of course, it's never really that simple because there are a few principal assumptions in the book I think we made that I now want to kind of challenge. I'm having an argument with myself this evening. Welcome to my brain. And one of them is that actually we've always assumed that there's just this future that's always been about growth. 
that we're just going to keep building more, that successful architects is only really determined by increasing range of scales or increasing budget allocation or number of potential units um, in a project. And that is our metric. That's how we judge the success of what we do. Um, and that, in fact, construction, because it's always been largely a boom and bust industry, as long as we're not in recession, there's an assumption that there'll just be more and more work and we can keep graduating more and more students to do that work. Um, but I think there's a kind of issue with understanding the fact that at the moment, forgetting about the construction industry, the external markets that really the construction industry is dependent upon are being called into question. Um, there is, and there's a really key reason why that is, um, but it's what we describe in economic terms, because I obviously spend a lot of time studying economics, as you can probably tell. Um, it's what we call contingency, so this idea that actually architecture, it could be um, outstanding as a profession, it could be exceptional. It has, no, it has no bearing, though, if it's ability, if it's codependence and it's interdependence on other markets and other issues isn't really understood properly. And I think that's what architecture has not really done. We measure ourselves against each other and not really about some of the wider challenges. But perhaps the biggest contingency of all is to think of the climate crisis. And I'm being very particular here about my terminology. I'm not calling it climate change. So the climate isn't changing, it's being, it's being pushed by us into collapse. Change sounds, seasons change, you know, we change clothes, we might change our tastes, but crisis is something else, you know, collapse is something else. And I think we need to use the terminologies that describe the problem accurately. So I think I bring this up because if I'm here to talk about the future of education, then we have to confront climate crisis as a curricular concern. And I think it obviously, again, reflects on what architecture is doing. So within schools of architecture, we're obviously required to train people to become architects to support the existing business model for architecture. But if the existing business model is one that's really complicit in the destruction of the planet through its processes as well as its outcomes, then really what are the obligations of a school? Because a school then has to rethink, are we here to just serve what we know to be unscrupulous professional practices or do we have a different kind of responsibility? Um, and of course what we do know is that we have really quite shaming um, role to play in the general destruction of the planet. So we know that construction waste is set to double by 2020. Um, interestingly, um, embodied carbon from building materials and construction represents at least 11% of global emissions, which most of which can actually be attributed to only three materials, which is concrete, iron and steel. Um, we also know that 70% of construction contracts in future will be reuse and not, build, um, not new build and yet we're still teaching students in schools of architecture to design from scratch. Um, I think that really is a challenge to us as well as practices. And we also have always been criticised for not being interested in the needs of the end user. And this comes back to my earlier point about litigation. Um, because at the moment the real end users are not the people that inhabit our spaces. The real end users are the people who um, in Africa right now are probably going to be flooded or starved because of famine or even turned into climate refugees because where they're from becomes uninhabitable because of the way that we're designing our buildings and because our buildings are not zero um, energy and the knock-on impact on the global south that the architecture of the global north is having. So I would describe as neo-colonialism because colonialism in an architectural sense is really not over. It didn't end with the classical orders migrating around the world and 1960s modernism being imposed on African dictatorships. So what we also have, and this is something that I find really fascinating, um, is the concept of speciesism that, you know, architects principally like to just design for people. That's what we say we do, even though most of us only really design for the developer or the client or whoever's paying us. Um, but there's, we've never really seemed to take into account the fact that there's billions of other species we should be considering in our architecture. Why aren't our buildings habitats for other species? Why they not have some ability to support insect life or animal life or even other forms of plant that are regional to our countries and our communities? Humanity has killed 83% of all animals on this earth and 50% of all plants. Only 16% of the world's animals and the remaining animals are actually wild. The rest are waiting to turn into our dinner at some point. So, you know, it's interesting when we talk about who architecture is for and the need to have a more expanded definition and really consider obligations in that respect. Hopefully that's not me.
So again, it comes back to this idea of architecture's metrics, how we judge what we do and we value what we do. Um, and again, whether or not it's about economic growth or expansion or profit or scale, um, whether it's about the kind of um, value of how we treat um, our end users and so on. There are other, some other uh, metrics I want you to consider because I think they're really, really interesting. Um, and one is around um, what we call, or what we think we know of as embodied energy. So as you probably know, and I'm sure many students in the room will be the biggest experts in this because I expect they're taught it in the way that I wasn't taught it when I was a student. We talk about embodied energy and we understand it to be the manufacturing, the extraction, and also the manufacturing processes um, that generate the materials that we specify in our buildings. So everyone's with me on that so far. But what we don't do is we don't think about what we're now calling energy. So energy really is a way of describing, um, and it comes from the work of ecologist um, Howard Odom, in case you don't know, and Keel Moe's work, excellent scholarship, which I've referenced here in case you're interested. Um, what they were looking at is how, what, how the construction industry fails to understand that energy is only really calculated up until the point that that I-beam or that concrete panel is produced. There's no understanding, no metric capture of what it costs to deconstruct that panel, what it costs to then recycle it or degrade it or even detoxify it because obviously many building materials when they just deteriorate become toxic, become pollutants um, and that's never really factored in so we have a very broken and limited understanding of what embodied energy is. And again, it comes back to this litigation question. You know, at the moment we might get sued by living clients, but what if, you know, 50 years from now we're getting sued by people who are born 20 years from now, who are being born into a world where there's all these bits of broken infrastructure that we haven't been able to upcycle or bury or sell to the Chinese, rotting away, contaminating our environments. Then our, if you like, the whole um, category of potential litigious clients starts to really expand into whole new populations and whole new communities. So that's just something to terrify you with briefly. Um, but returning also to Kiel Moe's research, um, it's very interesting looking at what it takes to create a building and I'm just going to show you this as an illustrative example. So this is a very small corner of Manhattan um, and also I'll refer to Manhattan now that I'm a native sort of because I spend a lot of time wandering around mainly doing this um, but trying to understand something about how this city came about and why so many cities are judged against it. You know, it's got a lot to answer for if you think about the, some of the iterations internationally that have happened in, as a mimicry of what New York is. So Kilmo's scholarship looks at the Empire State and it really perfectly illustrates the problem. So for example, you may be interested to know that um, only, and this is important, only um, six workers died building um, the Empire State um, building because in fact 60 died building the World Trade Center. So there's another metric here which is human capital in the building sites. That's an issue, why? Because if you go to Dubai and you see men falling off bamboo scaffold with no helmets on, no safety ropes, um, and at least a couple of hundred die every single year in Dubai building skyscrapers, then it is an architect's problem. Um, Zaha did was once challenged on this um, because she was building something in the Middle East and she said it wasn't an architect's remit and I would beg to differ on that point. But what's really interesting about this is that you, this, these are the various iterations that this building has gone through on this particular corner site. Oops, sorry, go back. Um, so this is in a 220-year capture, so it's 5th Avenue and 34th Street. It started out, as you can see in the far left, as a beautiful kind of, I would say, traditional um, farmhouse aesthetic. Um, built in the 1800s and then it became a mansion townhouse which you can see in the second iteration which is really what a lot of Brooklyn looks like and then it became the world famous Waldorf Hotel, um, Waldorf Astoria at the turn of the century and then very quickly within a, a 60 year lifespan became the Empire State Building. So what's interesting is not only the iteration, how quickly this happened, um, but you know you would have had possibly two to three people building that, maybe six workers on um, the, what we'd call a brownstone. I think there was about 200 in the Waldorf. And then on this particular building, obviously, the Empire State, you're looking at 3,400 workers. So the kind of work capital ratios of deaths um, starts to increase quite rapidly. But this is you know, interesting, but more fascinating to me is this is actually where the Empire State is from. So I apologize for the poor graphics and lighting. 
but it came from something like eight other countries. Its materiality principally comes from England, from Portland, which is a huge stone quarry just off the south coast of England. So when we start to understand what, it, what a building is in terms of its global obligations and its potential global impact, it isn't just around whether or not it's zero carbon and its performativity as a finished building. It's also about all of the processes used to extract those materials, all of the miles they would have traveled to be installed on site. In coming also from countries where in some cases there were very poor employment rights and so on, and even in some cases child slavery, which is still affecting the construction industry. We're in the top 10, by the way, for employing modern slaves. So that's something else to think about. Um, and then of course, and I, I, pro I promise you it gets more optimistic soon, just not yet. I did want to tell you about the sixth mass extinction because sometimes this can be encouraging because um, one would hope that every time we have one, mainly annoying people die and then we're fine, like all of the billionaire capitalists who are killing the planet. But let me explain what a mass extinction is because it's not everybody seems to understand this and in fact I didn't understand it. So we, we are facing the sixth mass extinction. It's looking pretty much a definite. Um, but a mass extinction does not mean that everything dies, it means that most things die. So very important thing to remember. Um, so 450 million years ago was our first, and in that iteration, 86% of all the species died. Another 70 million years after that, um, we had 75% die, so a bit better, you know, this time you're looking at 25% survival rate. And then another 125 years after that, um, actually it was quite a severe one, only 4% of the existing um, plants and animals lived, so 96% died. And then then 135 million years after that, 75 again and so on. So, you know, we're not sure necessarily, sorry if I'm doing something with the mic, um, what the next one will look like, but I think we should be fairly confident that based on that ratio, and if you look around the room, you'll see what I'm talking about, that we're maybe looking at possibly a row, um, a full row of people left in the room on that ratio of all plants and animals and peoples across the planet. Um, and that's kind of a worrying thought, um, but I always find it kind of interesting because as I was growing up, I was always imagining the end of the world to involve things like asteroids or space invaders or aliens or something kind of external, you know, AI, computers taking over like war games. It was never really presented to me in architecture school that actually I might be complicit in my own destruction. So climate science, for those that don't know, is only 30 years old as a science. It's only really invented in the sort of 60s and 70s. Um, and that's when really we started to understand what we were doing to our planet. But what's fascinating to me that since we've figured out what we're doing, the speed at which we're doing it has just increased. So you would think that with knowledge of the destruction, we might slow down or even try to reverse the speed, but we're actually doing more damage than we ever were. So where is architecture and all this? We have to ask ourselves. And one last thought, it only took a, diff a temperature difference of five degrees to trigger all the last mass extinctions. We're already on course. So I'm gonna get to the optimistic bit in just a minute. But my point is, and this is looking to the artistic work and scholarship of Tim Morton, if you don't, if you don't know his work, he's um, one of the world's leading philosophers looking at the moment about what ecology means. Um, and he did a collaboration with um, Justice Bryce um, Guiaragilia, I'm not gonna pronounce that correctly, I know. Um, but they, he's an artist and what they did was put all these, um, these kind of road signs up across the United States. These are very typical hazard signs for when there's road works, um, just to try and get people to understand the problem of um, what, what we're really facing. But what I like about this is, in a way, if I could edit it, I would probably put architects are the asteroid, that in fact, at the moment, the role we are playing in relation to the catastrophe is so serious and such a big scale compared to so many other sectors that we really do need to take the whole threat seriously and realize that we shouldn't operate anymore in a monkey cage, some kind of rarefied space where despite our high intelligence and extreme skills, we still are not finding solutions to the problem and doing something much more meaningful instead. So where does this leave architecture education? And you know, just a quick nod to any Pink Floyd audience and um, Pink Floyd fans in the audience um, that have appropriated um, a rather juicy bit of the wall here. Um, but one of the problems that architecture has is that, you know, as a vocational degree, as it's known, and that's in many ways denoted by its accreditation systems, that we do have to prepare students for industry as is. Um, but at the same time, it's beyond our responsibility to simply run schools of architecture as some form of qualification mill. Um, 
And I think, you know, if you think about how quickly what we teach in architecture schools is evolving, CAD didn't really exist when I was a student now, it's mandatory and part of everything. Um, there's going to be quite a lot of change affecting schools that are beyond the climate crisis right now, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, but I was also thinking more generally about what architecture's canon is, this idea that you know, we still think that we can hold on to what we believe to be the true principles of architecture. Um, and where I think this gets exciting is that actually it's not about throwing out the canon. Okay? Because I, had, I did a talk very similar to this um, in Münster in Germany a month ago. And one very old architecture academic, white man obviously, said to me, you know, are you just suggesting we just destroy all architecture's knowledge? And I'm like, no, no, but I think we need to start thinking about what's lacking from it. How do we build it out so it responds? So in this particular example, which is Vitruvius, you know, all that was missing from this is a fourth criterion, which is sustainability. I think that's really the opportunity here. It's not about a sort of deconstruction or an abandonment of what we, are, we know we're good at. It's about an advancement and an, an enrichment of what we do coming back to the point of radicalism again. So obviously afterlife, I'm kind of unpackaging in lots of different ways in this talk. And in some ways, the afterlife of the planet, there'll be a whole new form of architectural opportunities for us, the 4% of us or 10% of us are, who remain, I imagine, designing, trying to hobble together, you know, um, housing or schools out of bits of radioactive material, who knows, um, or even building the next Atlantis. But if we can pull ourselves back from that eventuality for a moment, there are other existential challenges that architecture is facing. So we can choose to see them as threats or we can choose to see them as opportunities. So the first is obviously automation, um, the stuff of sci-fi, but it's really interesting to understand that according to McKinsey Global Institute report in 2017, the expectation is that around 800 occupations in 46 countries, which means about 400 million um, or even up to 800 million jobs will be lost even in the next five years to automation. You start thinking about how much automation there is in architecture from BIM and CAD to you know, now artificial bricklayers, and you start to see that whatever we think we're doing will be radically different in five to ten years with or without a climate, climate collapse. Um, and similarly, you know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest careers at the moment that we take for granted or we understand to be um, lucrative in some cases uh, are at, at risk and architecture is potentially on the career extinction list if what we think we're doing is really just operating as a rarefied computer uh, solely interested in um, doing designs without bringing in more of the human factors to what we do. Um, but certainly things I would argue that are mundane sometimes, dealing with CAD and BIM and 3D printers and you know, that kind of thing, we could well be liberated from those as tasks that we're obligated to perform, so it can't all be bad. Um, but the other thing to add into this <coughs> is that 85% of the jobs that we'll be doing um, within the next 10 years have yet to be invented. So I don't know if any of you have heard of a rewilder. But apparently it's the next big career. Rewilders will be paid money to go around just basically trying to sow seeds everywhere of plants and goodness knows in a desperate attempt to operate in place of all the bees we've annihilated um, amongst other things. So apparently that's the next big career. But it does present certain challenges for architecture because even if we survive into that residual 15%, I still think what we're doing is going to be very different. So here are some illustrations of what may be different. Firstly, we need to start looking at the fact that we're now dealing with notions of the post-human typology. So earlier we talked about speciesism, but humans that remain and those that we seek to choose to design for, um, at the moment in the world there are a growing number of cyborgs, people who deliberately have their bodies altered with technology, implants and so on. Um, and of course, as we start to design more and more AI competent and human replicants, as they're called, um, as sci-fi informed as they're called, um, you know, designing for accommodation for them will be quite different. Where does that leave architecture and its end user obligations? Um, especially because we'll need to move away from notions of the modular man and a certain set of metrics. Robots don't need a house, they just need a cupboard, you know, that kind of thing. And if you look to what's happening in some of the innovative tech companies, entire server spaces such as Facebook's headquarters, um, which is obviously the data centre in, in, in Pineville, this was Sheeran Partners in 2012, this actually contains the data of 1.9 billion users. So in a way, particles of you, if you're a Facebook user, live in that shed. So an abstraction of you, the essence of you, is accommodated here. So our expanded definition of who we are, the threshold of us as human beings, is starting to shift. And again, that has implications for us as creatives, as innovators, and how we might respond. 
So of course, what I've done is again present a slightly dystopian but hopefully intriguing confection of what another angle on this afterlife suggestion. I'm now going to talk a bit about my school. This isn't a promo, by the way, although you're all very welcome to come anytime you want to hang out. Um, it's interesting, you know, when you look at architecture schools like what those schools that are kind of trying to do something different. Um, you know, what is it that we, what's our remit? What are we, what we capable of within the constraints of a validation? We have NAAB, we're about to get RIBA. On top of that, um, we're in an institution that has its principles. We're working within a state that has its educational requirements and within a country that's being led by someone who's challenging. Um, so, you know, it's very difficult to know like what is the bandwidth of what we can and can't do. Um, so to talk a bit about our school, because I think Origins is always a good place to start. Charles Pratt, born into poverty, one of 11 kids, um, created Pratt um, on this particular site. So you can see here the kind of area of Brooklyn before it was turned into our institute. Um, and he made his money having come from poverty um, in the 1860s, but he did it in unscrupulous ways. So what he did was he had a big oil refinery and pumped loads and loads of waste into the East River and killed all the fish and all the plant life and everything else. So pretty bad stuff and still, re still remains enormous amounts of toxicity that they cannot shift. Um, so obviously he was operating at a time when he didn't really understand the impact of what he was doing. But at the same time, he believed that um, workers who worked in his refinery should have um, the right to decent housing, to be accommodated properly. So he was a pioneer of some of the most progressive forms of social housing in New York, housing that's still really recognized um, as being exemplary even today. As, an, as extension of that, he built Pratt Institute and was the first school of architecture actually to admit women right from the inception of the school. Um, because he really believed that men and women should all have equal access to education. And again, that the working class of Brooklyn should have right to a free education. So in a funny kind of way, you know, it started out with, you know, poor guy becomes bad guy polluting the river, um, becomes good guy sort of because he created social housing in a school. So it's, I seem to be in a school that's essentially a washing machine on rinse cycle. But it, I think the values of it, you know, this idea of actually keeping it community engaged and inclusive is still something that underpin a lot of what we do. So coming back to this question of mandate, that does give me some agency to start shaping what I think the school can become. Um, of course, what we also have, and this is some 170 years later, is I am dealing with students who haven't even applied yet and they email me all the time. I must get at least 30 emails a week from students uh, or want to be students saying, you know, I'm worried about the planet. It's the principal concern of students right now. They say, well, I want to know that I can have the skills to deal with the problem. I want to know that I can make a difference. Um, will your school support me in being able to learn about these things? And I have to, you know, kind of pause before I answer the question, because the truthful answer is we are trying. We are developing pedagogies and curriculum that we believe will give you those skills. But things are changing so quickly. You know, a big chunk of ice, you know, the Antarctic melted at the weekend, as I'm sure you know. The speed of change is so rapid, it's hard to even know what a relevant skill is from one week to the next. But, you know, we have to make a commitment that we will at least try. Um, so I think that's a really important part of what Pratt is trying to do, and I think the most progressive schools, is to allow students to have what we called autodidactic agency. So in other words, some influence over curriculum, some stake in what we teach and how it's taught and who we bring in as critics and what kind of assignments we set for students and so on. Um, because the problem's extending far more beyond buildings now. And of course, what we also need to do is, as I have just done, um, admit to some of the um, issues, shall we say, with our institutions. So you may or may not know, I mean, you probably recognize this as South Africa, but you know, Harvard College, most of its wealth and privilege, and this is the same with Yale and many other American institutions, was built from the 260 years of American slavery. Um, so those assets are still really part of that bricks and mortar. You may have followed stories about ideas of repatriation in America, the idea of giving money back to former slave descendants in order to give them resources to go to college. That's been very tokenistic work done in that area. But there continues to be issues around the recognition of the fact that so many of our institutions assets are really born of exploitation. So how do you find a balance with that? How do you confront that in challenging history, even in your own institution? Um, and of course, you probably heard about 
the course to decolonise the curriculum. This is my definition. There's many definitions. I'll be sending the PowerPoint, obviously, to Antoine, who can share it with you if you're interested in these things. But it's a very popular um, argument right now that we need to start looking to understand decolonisation of our schools, not just in terms of what they're made from, but the curriculum and who teaches it and how it's taught. And that's one of really the big challenges that all schools are facing. It's now embedded in our strategic plan for the institution. More and more US schools, more and more British schools are trying to do this as well. It's explicit commitment to address the problem. Also, and I'm sure you've done this for fun, if you put into Google Masters of Architecture, unsurprisingly perhaps, you mainly get a bunch of white guys with maybe one or two um, Asian guys, but not many women, um, and certainly not many African Americans or um, people from other regions. So, you know, one of the challenges we have in schools of architecture is we know that we lose more students from minorities um, than we do who are white um, and male. So how do we make sure that students feel welcome and included? How do we shift the profile of faculties so that you can be what you can see rather than feel that you're not reflected within schools of architecture? Because, of course, if we can't make schools diverse, then we're not going to be able to make practices diverse. Affordability is a really critical problem because across the US and the UK, if you are not white, you will be paid less. It's called structural racism, in case you're not sure. Um, but it's unfortunately a legacy of um, in, in inequalities historically. So how do we address this problem? How do we make sure that um, education becomes more affordable? The question of leadership. So obviously I'm a female dean in America right now. I think after, I don't know if you've heard about Me Too movement, I'm sure you have, but we had a shitty men in architecture list, which was pretty interesting as well. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but um, every now and again, one of them shows up in my crits and it's literally like, I have to call the Me Too police and have them removed. No, I don't do that bit. I just tell them at the end not to come back. But, um, but you know, it's very interesting now that America's reaction to that is to have a lot of female dean hires, which has just been a whole swathe of us in the last 12 months. Um, we're all quite white though, that's a problem. So, you know, it's slow progress, but we're getting there. Um, and it's interesting being in a position to then set the trajectories for school, start to have different kinds of conversation about what matters in architecture, but never with the intention of excluding everybody. Because you're never going to fight sexism if you make it about one or the other. It has to, we have to collectively find a solution to the problem. So um, similarly with retention in architecture, you know, we still have an issue that even in architecture schools, um, students are dropping out, so it's not just that practice conditions are difficult, it's our schools that are make, you know, in many ways make students feel that it's difficult to be there and maybe they want to move on and do other things, and that's a real problem. Um, so what are we doing in schools that is giving a clear message that some demographics are going to find it harder or maybe not as welcome? And then, of course, what we call linguistic relativity. I've, done, I've written about this, if you follow my scholarship, a big paper on architecture and linguistics um, and the issues with the, the naming of tools, et cetera, et cetera, and spatial production. Um, but you may have heard of this. It's called a website called ratemyprofessor.com. I'm far too shy to ever look um, at what they've written about me. But if, as a professor, you should bravely look sometime. Um, and your students um, write about you, as it turns out and they write all kinds of things about you. And in America, they write about you if you give them an F. So if you're a tough marker, you've probably got a really big profile over there right now, and it's going to be pretty nasty. Um, what's interesting is some researchers did an analysis a couple of years ago where they looked at the language used to describe male and female professors, so professors of the same rank and status, um, and how the students were reviewing them, and realized that even the students who were coming in, you know, much more radical than potentially a lot of professors, were still using very gendered language to describe professors who were male and female. So female professors were being categorized as bossy and men as genius for exhibiting exactly the same behaviors within class. So, you know, we, we're still dealing with a lot of external um, discrimination being brought into the schools by our students. How do we create the spaces to have a different kind of dialogue around those inequalities and those perceptions? And then this point about reciprocity. So um, at the moment, I was talking to someone who's a really good expert, if you're ever interested in these things, um, called Adrian Lahoud, who was my former dean at the RCA. His work very specifically looks at climate justice. Um, and I think one of his most important insights is that we are not all in this together, which was the point I was making earlier, that you know, the impact of what we do in the North impacts really dramatically, far more dramatically in the South um, because of differentials in terms of climate and so on. But I mean, what students are often saying is, why am I always being asked to design for these kind of like North, North um, American contexts? Why am I not being part of a different kind of conversation about going to sites where we know there's real problems and actually working collaboratively to come up with new solutions for those contexts? So it's very interesting now sort of understanding that 
outside of what we think Western architectural education is, and it is very Western, that when you start going into Global South schools, a lot of them are actually had to abandon a lot of the principles of, of Western architecture because they don't fit the climate, they don't fit the environment, they don't fit the community or the context at all. So they started to evolve their own completely independent pedagogies, which, by the way, is in a book that will come out next year that I've written um, all about this. Um, I'll talk about another book in a minute to you. And of course, that at the moment, architects have the misfortune of often aligning themselves with really corrupt people. Um, in this case, as you know, these were the competition entries for um, Trump's wall between Mexico and North America, which at the moment is being built. I mean, there's several thousands of miles of wilderness to get through. Oh, and a few sacred Native American Indian sites, which they've just bulldozed recently. And that clearly isn't going to stop Trump. Hopefully the election will. Um, but in the meantime, you know, architecture is in a position where it's sending a very clear message, I think, that it has conflicted loyalties. Is it truly, as a professional should be, in the service of the public? Because that's actually the true definition of professional, a public servant. Or is it really just in the service of a very small elite and actually in the service of very corrupt and misguided initiatives such as this one? Um, and of course, you know, coming back to the earlier statistic, um, about the fact that the majority of um, buildings will be designing within the next decade are going to be um, repurposed buildings rather than new build. What, what is our curricula really asking students to do if the pr critical emphasis is on innovation only as um, invention and never as actually um, a, re a reconfiguring of what we have or a repurposing of resources? I think there's the biggest innovation for me is around taking recycled materials or taking a, an existing site and do something really progressive with it because those constraints are what make something innovative. You know, innovation is defined by being born of a challenge, not something straightforward because then it really wouldn't be innovative, would it, if it was simple? Um, this is just an example of an old dairy that's now a public cinema in Germany. So the other afterlife, because um, I've only got two more afterlives out of my five, dog, and I'm wary of time, eight more minutes, I will keep to time. Um, is that um, all these architecture graduates, while I'm worrying, worried you all in fact about architecture's destructive force, we're like a kind of villain out of a comic book in some ways so far, right? Um, but the interesting thing is that actually the majority of architecture students think, I might not want to do this, I might just go and do something else. Um, and what architecture tends to do when that happens is to say, well then you're not an architect, and we're not going to call you an architect, we're not going to acknowledge you, we're not going to invite us to invite you to our parties, our weddings, our bar mitzvahs, and then they're just kind of ignored, despite the fact they've had this astonishingly rich education and are really, really skilled. And in America it's even more acute, um, only 40% of US graduates, um, actually about the same, but less maybe, will become architects, yeah, so worse. So this, it's really interesting to me that, you know, when the majority of our students, and this is just two um, statistics, I'm actually doing a much bigger study across Europe um, to see whether this is reflected elsewhere. But when the majority of our graduates are leaving the profession, um, is that necessarily a bad thing? And actually, where do they go and what do they do? Um, and this again comes back to this notion of afterlife. Sorry, I have, I'm have having a bad relationship with my mic. Um, because architecture's afterlife, in a way, is not just the architects who think architecture is just about buildings, but the architecting of other things. Um, so as an illustration, and these are two things I'm doing at the moment, I'm going to talk about one. I was given 500,000 euro last autumn by the European Union, Erasmus Knowledge um, and Alliances study to look at where architects are, or architecture graduates are going, if not architecture. So now this is a pan-European study. You, you students, I hope, will be sent information this summer and being asked to complete a questionnaire about this and hopefully your alumni office will send this out to all the people that you went to school with and we're going to track it across the whole of Europe. But the idea is to really understand what is our multi-sector influence because from the early stage study, we had about 3,000 respondents in our prototype inquiry. Turns out that a lot of architecture graduates are going into filmmaking and going into CGI. So when we looked at it, we kind of thought, why are so many going into film? And then we realized, if you do film studies, you do maybe three weeks in a three-year BA degree where you actually do any virtual environment modeling, you know, CGI. An architecture student is working in virtual space for five years, maybe more. So naturally, they're going to be more qualified to work on you know, CGI for major film producers and production houses than a film studies student is. And similarly, if you think about what we're taught in terms of epistemologies, and I'll talk about that in a moment, the richness of your education, just jumping over to this slide, 
So these are the epistemologies here, natural sciences, formal science, humanities, social sciences. Architecture is kind of, in, in a way, the, the love child of many parents. It's like a 1960s party that just got really, really messed up and then architecture was born. But what's interesting then is that, you know, you kind of have the epistemologies here as my black bubbles, forgive my doodle, and then, you know, kind of some of the disciplines. But architecture, I think because it's got so many parents, one would argue that it's more of a practice than a discipline because it's an embodiment of multiple disciplines and it's that richness that gives our graduates an exceptional advantage over people who've just spent the same amount of money buying one, buying just a bit of sociology or getting a degree in anthropology. So that, you would think, that is an exceptional skill set um, to take on any challenges, including climate collapse. And I just wanted to talk about this book. This is my book that's coming out in autumn, just checking, yes. And this is with Rory Hyde from the V&A in London and Roberta Maracaccio. Um, and what we did is we, it was kind of an extension of this idea, like where are architects going, rather than you know, do the European study is very empirical, lots of data. And I wanted to do something that was much more of a qualitative, narrative-driven account of this. So we interviewed people who've become filmmakers. So Gran Torino computer game turns out the woman behind it, and it's a woman in fact in this computer game, went to architecture school, dropped out and then did, designed the whole of Gran Torino. It's not designed by guys. Um, so we've interviewed her for that book, examples of her work. We've got um, performance artists, we've got obviously filmmakers, we've got people who are curators, journalists, and these are all um, interviews and testimonies and case studies of really, really astonishing work with people who got an architecture degree and just decided, forget it. And there's loads of others that we couldn't get an interview with. For example, I kept routinely tweeting Ice Cube um, you know, and Samuel L. Jackson desperately trying to get an interview, but sadly none of them replied. It's a bit disappointing. But there are lots of other rich pickings in there. But it illustrates the point, doesn't it? This Coming back to this, you know, if we have a climate that's collapsing, if we have a world that's potentially reached peak disruption, um, who is really best placed to draw from a really diverse range of skills and expertises to confront these problems? And then, by implication, and also similarly to, to use three-dimensional problem solving, which we know from pedagogy, i.e. learning theories that transcend discipline, in case you're wondering, um, that in fact, anyone who can solve problems in three dimensions is far advanced as a thinker, regardless of the discipline or the sector or the context or the scale of the problem. So again, these really exceptional skills that architects spend years getting um, predispose us to be best placed to really tackle the problem. And of course, you know, as, as Antoine began with this nice um, introduction to my lecture where I didn't obviously reveal to him that I was intending to traumatise you for at least half an hour before getting to the promised land um, and I am aware that I have two more minutes so I promise I won't go over time. Um, you know I was going to, I was here really, you know he described how I was going to show you, talk about all these architects who are working collectively and inclusively to you know, respond to this new future for architecture that they were going to be, you know, for the graduating students, I know there's many students in the room, to feel a sense of optimism about what they could do when they graduate um, and a sense of, of value and potential value of their skills um, and really the scale of opportunities to become innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, and that architecture, you know, I was going to show you examples of what, you know, cultural and civic value could look like. I mean, you know, if you have expanded definition of civic beyond thinking of it as a something that's a square in the middle of a town and to be something that extends all the way to the global south and you know again it's pushing back on these terminologies so what I've really tried to do is you know present that to you but in a kind of slightly Trojan horse way because my conceit is in fact that tomorrow's leading architecture practices are in this room and I mean this because I think that at the moment we keep looking and we keep expecting somebody to come in and tell us that they've got a solution to what the problem particularly is. And what I didn't want to do is give you just a series of case studies this evening that showed you the who of how to be a different architect, but really the how. So what I've done is give you an account of all the things in professional practice that I would hope at least one or two things from tomorrow you will go away and you'll start thinking, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to make sure I check the specifications and check where this is coming from, this material. I'm going to think more carefully about whether this is zero carbon. I'm going to think more carefully about the gender balance in my office or my faculty or my practice. I'm going to start to understand what my obligations are to people beyond the client, beyond the person who's paying the bills, beyond the end user, to the next generation, to the people living in an area that will be more directly impacted if I get this wrong. So I would hope that this evening what I've done is really put you in the driving seat of leading that change, of making you appreciate that the opportunity resides with you as much as the obligation does. Thank you very much for your time this evening.